afternoon, everybody. The next two sessions, we're going to talk about defenses against virus infections. And we're going to start today by talking about intrinsic and innate defenses. After the break, we'll talk about adaptive defenses. So what does all this mean? Here is my diagram of the immune system, simplified. Four brick walls, which represent host defenses. We have uh, intrinsic. First, we have actually anatomical and chemical defenses, which I didn't uh, mention in my description. These are always with us. They comprise physical barriers that we've talked a little bit about, like mucus, saliva, stomach acid, tears, your skin as a barrier to infection, scabs, and proteins in your skin called defensins, which have antimicrobial properties. First discovers in frogs, which have amazing antimicrobial peptides in their skin. So they're always present. Then we have intrinsic defenses. If things get over the anatomical barriers, and a lot don't, we, we're protected by a lot of, from a lot of infections by those. We have our intrinsic defenses, which are, again, always present. Uh, they're immediately available. We'll talk about some of those today. They include autophagy, apoptosis, microRNAs, and CRISPRs. Then we have innate immunity, which takes minutes to hours to induce. It's not there all the time. This includes natural killer cells, complement, antigen-presenting cells, neutrophils, and cytokines. So we will talk today about intrinsic and innate defenses, mostly about innate because it's a really well-orchestrated system of defense. And then finally, if a, a virus or any pathogen has got beyond the innate wall, it encounters the adaptive system, which is made up of T cells and B cells. And we'll talk about that after break, how that works for viral defenses. Now, the idea here is that you have a series of walls, and each one poses a barrier. And fewer and fewer viruses get by them. But if you manage to get by the last one, now hopefully acquired immunity protects you against infection. But we know not all infections have a good outcome. Some hosts die uh, because the, the virus wins in the end. So let's talk about intrinsic defenses. Uh, again, this is again a, a repeat of uh, what I just told you. Intrinsics are always present in the uninfected cell, and we'll talk a little bit about apoptosis, RNA silencing. Uh, innate immune is induced by infection, and adaptive immunity is tailored to the pathogen. So that's the only immune defense that is tailored to the pathogen that's infecting. Takes about two weeks to develop because it has to be tailored to the pathogen, but innate and intrinsic. Well, innate is induced nonspecifically, as we'll see, and intrinsic is always present. So one example of intrinsic defenses is RNA interference. This, we think, is largely restricted to plant and invertebrate cells. There's a lot of controversy about whether RNA interference is a defense in mammals. There are a few papers on this. They're controversial. Not everyone believes them. We think that maybe we don't need RNA interference. We have protein-based immunity, which plants and invertebrates don't have. They depend largely on RNA interference. And so the jury is still out. We still don't know. But in insect cells and in plants, uh, there's a wonderful system wherein if a virus infects the cell, if it's a double-stranded RNA virus or it makes double-stranded RNA during its infection, an enzyme called Dicer, it's a host enzyme, chops up the RNA into 21, roughly 21 nucleotide pieces. Uh, and then the single strand of those pieces are called SI or RNAs, small interfering RNAs. They will defend against infection by the same virus. So they will combine uh, in a risk complex which includes an enzyme called Ago Argonaut, and that chops up uh, a, a viral RNA. So the siRNA acts as a guide. It directs the risk complex to the viral RNA, and it chops it up. So the viral RNA is degraded here. So in other words, the RNA is used as a template to direct the risk system, the RNA interference system, to the viral RNA. And this is very important in plants and insects. It's been shown experimentally. 
as I said, there's some evidence that it can exist in certain uh, mammalian cells, but it's not clear yet. So we'll say right now, uh, this kind of intrinsic defense, RNA interference, is not found in mammals. However, there are other kinds of intrinsic defenses, and I just want to give you, I think, two examples of them to give you a familiarity with them. One of them is called the wonderful name APOBEC3, apolipoprotein BMRNA editing catalytic polypeptide. It was named before we understood its role in intrinsic defenses. This is a protein that's always present in our cells. So down at the bottom here, A3G, that's APOBEC3, it's one of the different kinds of APOBECs. Uh, it can be incorporated into virus particles. And what we're showing at the bottom here is A3G, the orange ovals being incorporated into HIV particles. So these particles bud off from the cell. Then when the particles infect a new cell, you know, one of the things that happens is reverse transcription. The RNA genome, shown in green, is, is reverse transcribed to form DNA. Well, that's where APOBEC proteins act. They, can, they are extensive mutagenesis proteins. And as you might tell, well, you can't tell from the name, they are deaminases. So let's say we have the viral RNA coming into the cell. It's reverse transcribed to get minus strand DNA. And then the C residues are deaminated, and that makes them into U residues. The deamination is done by APOBEC, it's an enzyme. And then when the DNA, when the minus strand DNA is copied to a plus strand, you have, instead of a, a G being put in, you have an A, because the U is present. So you get extensive mutagenesis of the viral genome as a result, and the virus is not infectious anymore because there are too many uh, G2, uh, U, G2A mutations in the genome. The, the APOBAC also inhibits DNA synthesis. So this is process results in antiviral effects by um, mutagenesis, and it's been called a WMD, a weapon of mass deamination. Now it turns, now you may wonder, why does HIV infect anyone if we have this uh, APOBEC protein around? Well, as will be a theme throughout the next two sessions, viruses antagonize. Any virus that's around today has evolved to antagonize some aspect of immunity, and APOBEC is no exception. HIV exists because it contains a protein called VIF, V-I-F. does not stand for Vincent factor. It's virus inhibitory factor. And what VIF does is direct APOBEC to the proteasome. You know what the proteasome is? Does anyone know? It's a giant garbage, uh, what's the thing in your sink called? Yeah, the trash disposal thing in your sink. You put your food in, you turn it on. That is what the proteasome is. Its job is to chop up proteins that aren't needed anymore. And one of the tags for chopping up a protein is to ubiquitinate it. A, a small molecule called ubiquitin, shown here as a U, is enzymatically attached to the protein. And then the proteasome knows to destroy it. And so VIF directs uh, A3G to the pathway, so it gets ubiquitinated and it's degraded, and therefore uh, the virus particles don't have uh, APOBEC in them, shown on the top here. Now you may say, what's going on in the bottom? Well, this is a HIV mutant where, where the VIF gene has been removed experimentally from the genome, and then in those viruses, uh, APOBEC is present and it leads to deamination. That's how we understand how this works. So this is just one example of many different intrinsic proteins that are present in the cell. Presumably they get rid of a lot of virus infections we don't know about, but as I said, the viruses that are around today that are targets of uh, APOBEC have learned to get around it. Another intrinsic defense is called epigenetic silencing. That means not a gene is at, is at work here, but we're controlling gene expression. So as you know, DNA in the host cell is wrapped around histones. It's in the form of chromatin. And the, these, are, these are the histones, these pink uh, circles here. The DNA in blue is wrapped around them. It's very compact. Of course, when DNA is compact, as shown on the left here, it tends, genes tend to be silenced because RNA polymerase can't access them. But there are ways, and that's called silenced, and there are ways to compact the DNA by modifying the histones. Here, you show, we're showing a way to open up the DNA to make the genes accessible to transcription. In this case, what's happened is that the tails of the histone proteins have been acetylated. 
And so acetylation opens up the chromatin. It makes it accessible to RNA polymerase, and it can be transcribed. So open DNA is active. Closed chromatin is not. And acetylation and methylation are two modifications. These are epigenetic modifications that control whether a chromatin is open or closed. Now, when viruses infect cells, one of the responses is to compact the viral DNA. As viral DNAs enter the nucleus, they're chromatinized. They associate with uh, chromatin, and they're wrapped up around nucleosomes. Uh, and then they're silenced. And when that happens, they get directed to what are called PML bodies. On the lower left is an immunofluorescence photograph. This is a, a cell uh, in which the nuclei, so PML bodies are in the nucleus. And PML is a protein that's part of a PML body. This is where we think chromatin goes when it's silenced. And so a number of viruses antagonize this process. They don't want their DNA to be silenced. Uh, and so they try and reverse the formation of PML bodies, and they try and reverse uh, the compaction of their chromatins. And these are just some of the countermeasures to uh, epigenetic silencing. Human cytomegalovirus, which is a herpes virus, one of their proteins causes degradation of a cell protein that is needed for uh, histone deacetylation. So deacetylation will compact the chromatin. The virus doesn't want that, of course, so it will prevent that process. And then Epstein-Barr virus, another herpes virus, encodes a protein. Adenovirus encodes another protein that uh, affect the ability of the protein called PML to form these PML bodies. So the DNAs will not get localized to them. They will not be silenced. Okay, so silencing of DNA is a cell response to infection and viruses need to get around it. Otherwise, they're not gonna have a successful infection. So those are all intrinsic defenses. Another one is apoptosis, programmed cell death. Whether you pronounce that second P or not is up to you. I have pronounced it both ways and been ridiculed either way, so I have to settle on one way. You could say apoptosis or you could say apoptosis. Uh, anyway, programmed cell death, when a normal cell encounters some kind of a stress, which can be a virus infection, but it can be other things as well, this process begins where the cell is going to be sacrificed. It's going to die to save the organism, if you will. It's a very, very carefully orchestrated process with many genes involved. One of the things that happens is the cell begins to form cytoplasmic blebs on its surface, and that's shown in this photograph here of a cell undergoing apoptosis. You can see the blebs on the surface. Those are not normal. Uh, they will eventually break off into what's formed apoptotic bodies, and eventually this cell will die. But for our purposes today, a key part of this is the sampling of these apoptotic bodies by what we call sentinel cells. Macrophages, dendritic cells are always patrolling our body looking for foreign substances, and one of the ways they do so is by engulfing apoptotic body, and then they say, is there anything foreign in this? Is there a viral protein or nucleic acid and so forth? And if there is, things happen, as we'll see in a moment. So apoptosis is not only a defense, but it provides a way for sentinel cells to monitor uh, if we're being infected or not. At every step of today's and next uh, session, we're going to talk about how viruses antagonize all of these processes, intrinsic, uh, even, even the physical and chemical defenses, you know, the skin can be antagonized. Papo viruses can't replicate in the skin, but the skin falls off. I told you the other day, you know, a lot of dust in a room is your dead skin. That's how some viruses actually spread. They replicate in the lower layers, and as the layers of cells move up on your skin, the top layer falls off, and it has viruses in it. And that's why you get uh, warts on the bottom of your feet if you walk around locker rooms without protection without some kind of sandal because other people's skin has fall off, fallen off containing viruses and you pick them up, especially if you have abrasions in, in the bottom of your feet. So intrinsic, innate, and adaptive defenses, they're all antagonized in some way by virus infection. So this is a table which you're not meant to memorize in any way. It's meant to impress you how many different ways viruses antagonize one of these intrinsic defenses, apoptosis. Look at all these viruses here listed. And there are many cellular targets because apoptosis is a complicated pathway where many different things have to happen. There are various enzymes and receptors and ligands involved. And viral proteins have evolved that antagonize at every step of this pathway. And there is one 
conclusion from seeing a table like this, and that is unless a virus can evade these responses, it won't exist. The ones that can't are not with us any longer. So evasion is going to be something I mention at every step. Now here is an ancient intrinsic defense, which was only discovered about 20 years ago. And now it's in the news, of course, because its discovery is uh, probably going to lead to billions and billions of dollars of profit for the biotech industry, which is fine. Uh, but people are suing each other for the rights to this discovery, which I think is funny because when people started working on it, nobody cared. It was an obscure defense system in bacteria and archaea. About half of bacteria and 90% of archaea seem to have CRISPR, clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats. This is a form of an intrinsic defense against viruses or, in fact, any kind of DNA. DNA is always coming into cells, whether it be naked genomic DNA or plasma DNA. CRISPR is a way to defend against it. So here's an example of a, a bacteriophage is infecting a bacterial cell. The gen, uh, genomic DNA comes in. It is then chopped up by the host, and pieces of it are integrated into the host as kind of a memory of that infection. And then when the virus comes back, uh, that host array of host DNA sequences, and they're very, very large in the host cell, are transcribed into CR RNAs. And then these RNAs will guide enzymes, like Cas9, to degrade uh, a new incoming virus genome. So it's kind of a... A way, it's kind of a, an siRNA-like process in that the nucleic acid uh, guides the enzymatic machinery to degrade a virus DNA or a plasma DNA, whatever is coming into the host cell. So this is quite old uh, because it's in a lot of archaea as well as bacteria, and it's an effective defense. Now, why are people so excited about it? We can take this property and the enzymes and use it to make mutations in genes. We can cut out defective genes. We can replace genes. And so it's going to be a really big uh, industry. There, there was just recently a big lawsuit over this between Berkeley and uh, Harvard to decide who is going to get all the money for this. And what I think is funny is that, as I said, when, they, when people started working on it, they had no clue uh, what it was good for. And it turns out to be very useful. But that's the way science goes. Sometimes you never know. Uh, where the next great discovery is, is coming from, serendipity. And that's just a great example of that. First uh, question is, uh, intrinsic defenses are always present. Which of the following are included? Antibodies, T cells, epigenetic silencing, skin, mucus. The answer is C, of course. Epigenetic silencing is part of intrinsic defenses. Antibodies are adaptive. They are tailored to the pathogen. They come last, of course. Skin is what I call a physical defense. If you look at the first slide, I, I define that as something before intrinsic. <clears throat> so that's a very simple discussion of the intrinsic defenses. We don't have a lot of time to go into it. Um, it's very interesting, though. Next, we're going to talk about innate defenses pretty much for the rest of today. Uh, and this is a case where you know, if, things, if pathogens get through anatomical and chemical barriers, they get through intrinsic defenses. Uh, then the innate defenses are activated. This happens with, between minutes to hours after infection. It's very quick. And the innate immune system comprises what we call cytokines. These are proteins we'll talk about today. Sentinel cells, I mentioned this briefly, but that includes dendritic cells, macrophages, and NK cells, and a series of proteins in blood or serum called complement, which we'll look at briefly. Now, innate defenses are very important on their own right. They can stop a lot of infections, and they certainly do. But when infection gets out of control, when the innate system can't handle it, it can tell the adaptive system, this, I'm out of my league here. Please help. And then the adaptive system will kick in and make uh, antibodies and cytotoxic T cells. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit today, how that happens, but more next time as well. Now, the. Um, Innate immune system begins with Drosophila. Here's another example of why we need to study worms and flies. Do you remember Sarah Palin years ago during the presidential campaign saying, why are we studying worms and flies, right? She didn't take my course. She didn't listen to any of my lectures, because if she had, she would know that incredible discoveries come from studying them. The innate immune system was discovered first in Drosophila. And this starts in 1980, a uh, number of investigators in Germany both of them got Nobel Prizes for this. Christian Nusslein-Volhard and Eric Wieschaus, who 
was now at Princeton, I believe. They were studying development in flies. They wanted to know what genes contributed to the different developmental patterns. What they did, they would make fly mutants. And Drosophila is great because you can make mutations in flies very easily. And then they would see how the flies develop. So they found mutation in one gene. And the history says uh, Christiane was looking at it through a microscope. And she said, das war ja toll, which in German me means like awesome or cool or neat, something like that. And guess what? Toll became the name of the gene. The Drosophila people, the fly people, are cool about that. They name their genes in a nice way. And so this gene in flies was important for establishing the dorsal ventral axis, right? Nobel Prize 1995. And because she said toll, they called it the toll gene. Now it took a long time for people to figure out that this was the core of the innate immune system. Uh, 1996, it was found to have a role in fly immunity. Remember, it was discovered as a gene involved in development. But 1997, someone said, hey, should we look in mammals and see if there's a toll gene? Sounds like a simple thing to do, but that's what someone did. And lo and behold, tons of genes in mammals related to the Drosophila toll gene, and they were called toll-like receptors. And this was the beginning of our understanding of how the innate immune system works. Many people suspected that it was there. We knew that there were early responses to infection, but we had no clue how the pathogens were detected. So in mammals, there's a whole family of toll-like receptors. Here's the original toll gene in Drosophila, and here are all the different mammalian TLRs from one all the way to uh, nine or 10 or more, and they all have a very similar structure. They're made up of a leucine-rich repeat, which each of these horizontal bars shows. You can see there are many of them in the extracellular domain. They're transmembrane proteins with an intracellular domain. It's important because these proteins signal uh, into signaling pathways. This is called the tier domain, a toll IL-1 receptor domain. And this is on the right what these proteins look like. So here's the structure, the X-ray structure of the uh, extracellular domain of toll-like receptor 3. You can see all the leucine repeats here making up uh, this curved portion of the extracellular domain. These are thought to act as multimers. And you can see a dimer of TLO4 on the right. Again, transmembrane protein, cytoplasmic tear domain. Here are the two extracellular domains curved, acting as a dimer. And that's a piece of DNA being sensed uh, by this particular TLR. So from a protein, a gene in flies, we now have an understanding of the innate immune system. And from this, it just exploded. People found so many other things uh, as well. Now, of course, these, some of these TLRs are important for detecting virus infection. And, and some of them are listed at the bottom here. TLR2, for example, will detect uh, the HA protein of measles. So some of these TLRs detect proteins. Some of them detect uh, nucleic acids, DNA, RNA, uh, as well for different viruses. And also on this table are two other receptors. So we call these pattern recognition receptors, and they recognize pa uh, pathogen-associated molecular patterns, or PAMPs. You'll hear that word in the literature as well. Uh, Rig I and MDA5 are, are not uh, plasma membrane proteins, as are the toll-like receptors, but they're cytoplasmic helicases that are involved in nucleic acid sensing. So once the TLRs were found, then people went crazy looking for other sensors as well. So the idea here is that these are sensors of the innate immune system. They detect something foreign, whether it's protein or nucleic acid, and then the cell responds to it. So let's explore that uh, a little bit. So here is uh, an explanation of some of that. We have a cell. Plasma membrane is at the very top here. Uh, and here are some viruses infecting the cell. They, they bind their receptors. They're coming in. And as, as you may remember from our earlier discussion, uh, many viruses enter cells through endosomes. So a lot of these toll-like receptors are actually on the inside of the endosome. And that's where they recognize nucleic acid. Because really, in the end, RNA and DNA is pretty similar between viruses and cells. There, there are differences. But the, in this case, the, the presence of nucleic acid in an endosome is indicative of virus infection. So the sensors, the TLRs, are there on the internal membrane. If they detect uh, double-stranded RNA or single-stranded RNA coming in as a consequence of virus infection. What happens is uh, these receptors are connected to a signaling pathway. There are a variety of proteins attached to the cytosolic mm -hmm. domain. Phosphorylation events occur. 
-hmm. And then that turns on gene expression in the nucleus. And there are a number of mediators that do this. IRF3 is one of them. This is normally in the cytosol if it gets phosphorylated. It then goes in the nucleus, helps to turn on transcription. And again, the phosphorylation results when these toll-like receptors sense a ligand in the endosome. IRF7 is another one. And if kappa B, of course, also present in the cytosol under activation of TLRs will go into the nucleus. And these are transcription factors that then turn on the expression of a variety of genes, which we'll talk about today, including cytokines and the interferons, the antiviral interferons. Uh, there are also some TLRs on the plasma membrane that are thought to detect viral proteins, viral glycoproteins specifically. And then there are cytosolic helicases, which I mentioned. The Rig I is one of them. MDA5 is another. PKR is really an RNA sensor as well. If you remember from our discussion of translation, PKR will recognize double-stranded RNA. It gets activated, and it ends up phosphorylating EIF2, and that results in inhibition of translation. So it is a pattern recognition molecule. So that is how this innate immune system works. There are receptors throughout the cell that can detect viral proteins and viral nucleic acids. The output uh, are the proteins of the innate immune response. And we'll talk about these in a few moments. Now, in the last five years or so, there have been some interesting discoveries of DNA sensors in the cytosol. And one of them is shown here. It's called CGAS, cyclic uh, GA, GMP AMP synthase. This is an enzyme present in the cytosol. What it does when uh, DNA is detected in the cytoplasm, the DNA binds this enzyme, it activates it, and then the enzyme takes an ATP and a GTP and makes a cyclic GAMP molecule. And that's shown on the right here. This is a very interesting uh, molecule where we have a GMP and an AMP joined by this cyclic bond. You can see there are only two phosphates left from the original three on each one. And this is produced by CGAS when CGAS binds DNA. There's a very nice binding site for DNA in the CGAS protein. It activates the enzyme. You make this C uh, cyclic molecule. And then the cyclic molecule binds to a receptor on the ER in the cytoplasm called sting. Uh, and uh, the sting binding eventually leads to a signaling pathway uh, wherein IRF3 is phosphorylated, and IRF3 enters the nucleus, very much as we saw for TLRs. NF-kappa-B, uh, the inhibitory subunit is dissociated. NF-kappa-B goes in the nucleus. These are both transcription factors. Again, that turn on the synthesis of cytokines that have antiviral properties. Now, if you have been listening to this course, which I think you have been, you may be asking, why are we sensing DNA in the cytoplasm? Does that ring, does it give any of you a problem at all? Does it bother you? Remember, I talked about how DNA viruses get in cells. They dock on the nucleus for the most part, right? The DNA, if you look back at all the pictures I showed you, the DNA is going in the nucleus. So I don't know what this has to do with a virus infection. Now, the people who do this work are innate immunologists. And they say, they wave their hands and they say, the, the viruses must be leaky. They must be leaking DNA on their way to the nucleus. And I find that offensive that a virus would be <laughs> leaky, right? I don't think that happens. I think that these sensors must also be in the nucleus. And so that's where they would sense viral DNA. That would make perfect sense, right? And so people are now finding out that, in fact, uh, somehow uh, sea gas is, is active in, in the nucleus. The story isn't complete yet, so I can't show you a nice picture of it. But I figure in the next few years, we're going to see more about nuclear sensing of DNA, because in my view, that's where it makes sense. The cytoplasm, to say that you know, the accidental leakage of DNA out of a virus is, is stimulating this pathway seems just not right to me. But we'll see what happens. I could be wrong. Viruses have to modulate every step of these pathways. I just want to show you a couple here which have been sorted out uh, for uh, Epstein-Barr virus. Now here is a pathway where a virus is triggering TLR2 on the plasma membrane, and that's eventually going to lead to uh, NF-kappa-B coming in the nucleus and the turning on of cytokines, okay? 
Now, the, uh, this pathway, which is pretty complicated. You don't ever have to memorize any of these, by the way. You just need to know that signaling goes from the TLR into the nucleus. But in this case, the pathway requires ubiquitination of some of the intermediate components. You can see that by the U's on these, on these proteins like TRAF6 and NEMO has some U's on it. Uh, without the ubiquitin, uh, these pathways are not activated. Now, what happens here is that some viruses induce a protein in the cell called A20, wonderful name, uh, that actually blocks ubiquitination of uh, TRAF6. Uh, and Epstein-Barr virus actually encodes a protein called BPLF1 that blocks the ubiquitination uh, of TRAF6, and therefore the pathway is inhibited. It blocks TRAF6. It also blocks... Um, ubiquitination of NEMO. So basically BPLF1 blocks the signaling from TLR2 into the nucleus so cytokines are not produced uh, in virus infected cells. The other thing BPLF does is block the, the proteasomal degradation of I kappa B alpha. That's a subunit, that's the inhibitory subunit of NF kappa B that keeps it in the cytoplasm. So if you don't degrade uh, I kappa B alpha, it's the, the whole complex stays in the cytosol and there's no transcription of NF kappa B dependent uh, genes. So that's just one example of viral antagonism at a very specific place in one of these sensing uh, pathways. It's hap and, and there's so many examples that we don't need to go through them. You need to just understand the principle that any virus that's around today that's very successful is able to antagonize these pathways. All right, which of the following allow the innate immune system to distinguish microbes from self? Cytoplasmic helicases and TLRs, antibodies, apoptosis, apobec, all of the above. The answer is A, cytoplasmic helicases and TLRs. The innate immune system is comprised of those sensors and, of course, the sentinel cells and the cytokines that are produced, not antibodies. That's <clears throat> the next step, adaptive. And apobec is intrinsic. Now, among the proteins that are induced by innate sensors, like TLRs and cytoplasmic helicases, by the way, there are other sensors as well that we haven't mentioned. We don't need to go through all of them. Uh, the proteins that are induced, we generally call cytokines. And among those are interferons. These are very important uh, antiviral proteins with uh, a number of interesting properties I want to talk a little bit about now. These were discovered in the 50s. There were two scientists Isaacs and Lindenman, and what they were doing, they had chicken cells in culture, they were exposing them to influenza virus, non-infectious influenza virus particles, which they made by UV radiation or some sort. And then they would let the cells sit for a while and they would take the supernatant from those cells and apply it to fresh cells and then infect those cells with influenza and they found that inf infection was inhibited. So there was something in the medium of those initial cells produced by inactivated influenza virus particles that inhibited or interfered with infection of other cells. So it was called interferon. For many years, no one really understood how these worked. We knew they were proteins. There were different kinds in cells. Different cells made different sorts. We had, we had no clue how they worked until really around the time that uh, toll-like receptors were discovered. Uh, and then we started looking for receptors on the cell surface. And now we have a pretty good understanding of, of how they work. These proteins are made by virus-infected cells. They can also be made by uninfected sentinel cells. Sentinels, again, being uh, uh, macrophages, dendritic cells, NK cells. When they pick up, say, an apoptotic body that has viral nucleic acid or viral protein in it, they will respond. They'll sense that as foreign. They'll respond by making interferons as well as other cytokines. So here at the bottom we have a mucosal surface to illustrate this being infected by some virus particle, respiratory epithelium if you will. The virus uh, is replicating in these cells. The replication is being sensed by the innate immune sensors, TLRs, etc. And those cells begin to make uh, cytokines. In this example the cytokines have attracted a dendritic cell to this area. The dendritic cell can be activated by the cytokines, can also be activated by products released from dead and dying infected cells, viral antigens and so forth. Uh, and then the dendritic cells will proceed to a local lymph node 
for uh, further consultation, as you'll see in a moment. Now, these cytokines, of course, have antiviral properties in their own. They can induce some kind of uh, uh, viral resistance in these cells, as you'll see in a moment. But the first ones that we knew about were, were the interferons. We now know there are three classes of interferons. They're the type 1s, the alphas, and betas, 13 different types. Uh, the type 2, interferon gamma, uh, and then the type 3, interferon lambdas. And in these slides, the interferons are shown as purple blobs or a red blob, and they're binding to their cognate receptors uh, in the plasma membrane of the cell. So there are specific receptors for each of these three interferons, type 1, type 2, and type 3. They're different kinds of receptors. Uh, and the cytoplasmic domains, you can see these are all transmembrane proteins. The cytoplasmic domains are associated with a variety of protein kinases. And these, of course, phosphorylate other proteins and initiate signaling in response to interferon binding. So what's happening here is a cell is infected. The cell senses it's infected. It's producing interferon. These are binding to receptors and starting signaling, which is going to lead to more uh, gene synthesis, uh, mRNA synthesis. And that's shown here. So very quickly after infection, uh, within hours, interferons are made. They're made in a very big burst. And then by 10 hours, they start to go down. As you will see, their synthesis has to be regulated because they're nasty proteins. They, do, they can make you feel very badly. And so we don't want them on all the time. Some virus, for many years, we treated hepatitis C virus infections with interferon. And you just talk to someone who's received that therapy. They'll tell you how miserable it is uh, to, to take that for years and years. It makes you feel really bad. So interferons go on very quickly after infection. The interferon is secreted from the cell. It's a secreted protein. It then binds to a cell surface protein, depending on which type, different receptor. Uh, but here we're, we're showing interferon synthesis and then binding uh, to type 1 receptor. And remember, the interferon can be produced, is typically produced in the infected cell by sensing a viral nucleic acid or protein. It can also be made by other cells in response to viral antigens. Interferon is binding to the receptor and then initiates a signaling cascade, uh, in this case phosphorylation of these STAT1 and STAT2 proteins, which then associate with the third protein and then are competent to go in the nucleus and stimulate the transcription of the so-called interferon-stimulated genes. So basically, uh, STAT1 to IRF9 is a transcription factor that needs to be told to go in the nucleus. It does so when interferon uh, binds to the receptors. Now, these interferon-stimulated genes are very important. They're ISGs, we often call them. There are over a 1,000 of them. Most of them, we don't really understand how they work. And it's only been in the last five years or so that people have begun to ask, uh, which ones are made in response to a particular virus in a particular tissue, and which ones are inhibitory. So a couple of years ago, for example, we asked, if we take 400 ISGs, you can get the DNA for each one, would, how many of those would inhibit poliovirus? And only 18 of the 400 will inhibit poliovirus. So even though there's over 1,000, that's probably because there are some virus-specific ones, and there are also tissue-specific ones as well. So me mechanisms of most of these are unknown. I wanted to tell you another cool example of how retroviruses are part of us. We, we learned how making a placenta is a consequence of a retrovirus gene. Turns out that the enhancers for all of these interferon-stimulated genes, or for a large portion of them, are derived from retroviruses. So a long time ago, a retrovirus infected our ancestors' germline. Uh, it became integrated into our germ cell as an endogenous retrovirus, as we've discussed. And over the years, many of the coding regions of these retroviruses have been lost. Some of them are still there. But what remains are the LTRs. And a recent study at the University of Utah in Salt Lake has shown that uh, between 6 and 14 percent of the con promoter control regions of interferon-stimulated genes are derived from retroviruses. And these have happened, this has happened not just in people but many other species as well, as you can see from this slide. So here uh, at the top is a human, and we think that these retroviral elements that control our ISG response went in 
to our ancestors between 50 and 75 million years ago. Well, you can see lemurs and rodents, bats, uh, dogs, horses, cows, and elephants. They all have, I guess elephants don't, uh, many of them have insertions that run their interferon system. How amazing is this? There's all retroviral LTRs that have been repurposed uh, to give uh, responsiveness to interferon, essentially, when, when those STAT1, 2, uh, IRF9 trimers get in the nucleus, they're binding to sequences that are remnants of uh, retroviral LTRs. And again, this is probably one of dozens and dozens of examples of how retroviruses are helping us. So we, we actually talked to the authors of this study on one of my podcasts, and of course it's called Everyone's a Little Bit Viral. I would say everyone's a lot viral, really. Uh, and we talked with them, it's a pretty interesting story. So let's talk about some of these ISGs just briefly. And there are over a thousand. We don't know how most of them work, but we do know how a few work, and I think in the next five or 10 years we'll understand that better. Here's a pretty interesting one uh, called tetherin, or CD137. Initially called tetherin, because uh, it is a protein that ends up on the plasma membrane. You can see that little blue tether in there. It's a very interesting configuration. It's got uh, two transmembrane domains. Uh, they're both anchored in the plasma membrane. And what these can do is they can hold on to budding viruses and prevent them from leaving the cell. You can see they form dimers with one of the members stuck in the retroviral membrane and one in the plasma membrane. And you get these long chains of virus particles. This is an electron micrograph on the right uh, showing the chains of particles uh, lining up. And of course, these can't be released from the cell. They can't spread to another cell. So infection is inhibited. This is an interferon-stimulated gene. It's a way of getting early in infection, preventing virus spread. Brilliant. Of course, uh, this virus here is HIV. And we know HIV has been able to spread to many people, so it must have a way to antagonize it. And that way is, called, is a protein called VPU. And VPU is a virus protein that keeps tetherin in the endosomal pathway. It prevents it from getting to the plasma membrane so it can't uh, affect virus budding. And of course, we know this is how it works for HIV because we can make VPU mutants, which make these long chains of virus particles at the cell surface. So, a mechanism of ISG and a mechanism of antagonism. So that's a cool one. I like tetherin uh, a lot. Uh, there's another one I want to tell you about, which is a pretty recently discovered one in terms of its function. It's called IFIT1. Interferon-induced protein with tetratricopeptide repeats, number one. And there's also an IFIT2 and 3, et cetera. This one is cool because, again, it's an, it's an interferon-induced gene. It binds RNAs that lack 2 prime O methylation. Now you're thinking, what is he talking about? Okay, let's go back to the cap. The cap is the structure at the 5 prime end of the RNA, needed for translation, among other things. It consists of a, a G, in this case, linked to the first base in the RNA by a 5 prime to 5 prime linkage with three phosphates in between. Uh, an important part of the cap's function is methylation of the first three bases. So we have methylation at this N7 position of the base uh, of the G, that's a guanine up there. And then we have methylation at the two prime O position of the two sugars on base one uh, and base two, all right? Two prime O methylation. So IFIT binds RNAs that lack these two methyl groups here. Two prime O methylation. Now why is that antiviral? Because it turns out that not all viruses utilize cellular machinery to put caps on their messages, so they don't all have 2 prime O methylation. And so this protein will bind the 5 prime cap of RNAs lacking that methyl group, and that will prevent the cap binding complex from binding the cap, so translation is inhibited. That's why it is antiviral. Now just this week, a paper came out in which the structure of IFIT1 bound to the cap structure was solved, and that's shown here on the right. So the X-ray crystal structure, the protein on the left is shown uh, in the yellow and green and blue, and these are beta strands, of course, making up much of the protein. The cap structure is shown in red. You can see there's a lovely tunnel right in the middle of the protein in which uh, the cap 
fits in. And on the right is a space filling diagram of the same thing. You have the IFIT1 protein in the outline. And then here in the middle is a little tunnel where the five prime end of the RNA fits in. There's a cap binding pocket. And then there is a channel for the, the next few nucleotides, one, two, three, and four. And again, this is a beautiful, tight association between the RNA and IFIT. There's no way a cap binding protein is going to knock it off. But the RNA will not fit in this channel if these two positions are methylated. Just two methyl groups will prevent uh, the RNA from getting in. So that makes sense, of course. It won't inhibit host mRNA, uh, mRNA function because hosts have 2 prime O methylation. Now, do you think that some viruses have evolved to evade IFIT1? You cannot answer that incorrectly if you always say yes. Right? It's yes, every step of the way they have evolved something. And here's how some of viruses have evolved to do this. So here we have IFID1, which we know binds RNAs lacking 2 prime O methyl caps. Remember influenza virus? Its mRNAs are produced by cap snatching. They steal the 5 prime end of cellular messenger RNAs from the host. Those are the primers for mRNA synthesis. I hope you remember that. But here is a typical influenza virus RNA. Five prime cap plus 12 bases are derived from the host. So it's got two prime O methylation. It has the M7G, of course, and then the NM. The M is the methyl on the two prime of the next two bases. So this is not going to be antagonized by IFIT because it looks just like the host. Another way is what we talked about for picornaviruses like polio. They don't even have a cap at the 5 prime end, they have a VPG protein. So picornas and other viruses don't have caps. Uh, one way that they're translated, of course, is by internal ribosome entry. Uh, sometimes the uh, cap itself recruits the translation, I'm sorry, the protein, the VPG itself recruits the translation machinery. Either way, there's no cap for IFIT to bind to. So that's an evasion mechanism. It gets around uh, IFIT inhibi inhibition. Other viruses have evolved such that their methylases that build the cap end up putting the 2 prime O methyl on. So these viruses have enzymes that can make the cap look very much like that of the cell. So viral N7 and 2 prime O methylase. So these viruses, paramyxos, rhabdos, flavies, et cetera, have all adopted that strategy. And other viruses utilize the host uh, N7, 2 prime O methylase to make their mRNA. So they look exactly like host mRNAs. Polyomas, herpes, parvos, and retroviruses do that. And finally, in the alpha viruses, uh, these plus-stranded RNA viruses like chikungunya, they have a secondary structure very near the 5 prime end, very near the cap. The secondary structure binds IFIT, keeps it away from the cap so that the cap binding protein can interact with the cap. So those are some of the evasion mechanisms. Obviously, there are some viruses that don't do this, so they are subject to inhibition by IFIT1. So I thought this was a cool way of uh, illustrating an ISG function. Now, there are thousands, over a thousand of these different proteins. They have different effects on the host cell. And that's why we say the interferon system is dangerous. It induces the expression of many deleterious gene products, like IFITs and old, uh, tetherins and many other products that aren't so selective. They have effects on the host. Most of the cells in our bodies have interferon receptors. Uh, and so when we produce interferon in response to an infection, that's soluble, of course. It can go in many places in our bodies, and it can have a lot of consequences. In fact, we know that interferon binding to receptors can lead to things like systemic things like fever, chills, nausea, malaise, and much, much more. And every virus infection induces at least some amount of interferon. And that's why flu-like symptoms are so common. A flu-like symptom is fever, chills, nausea, malaise, lack of appetite. Many other symptoms fall in there. We call these flu-like because when you get influenza, you have flu-like symptoms. But almost every other virus does the same thing. And that's because flu-like symptoms aren't caused by flu. They're caused by the interferon system. They're caused by systemic effects of interferons uh, on our bodies. So the next time you get flu or some other infection and you have flu-like symptoms, please think of your interferons that are doing that. 
don't blame the virus. Although, of course, the virus triggers it, so we could blame them to a certain extent. And this is one reason why we have to modulate interferon responses. They go up quickly and then they're brought down by a regulatory network as well. It's another reason why treating people with interferon for long periods of time is not good because they feel lousy. Can you imagine being treated for a year or two with interferon? You always have flu-like symptoms. At some point, you're going to say to hell with this and you stop taking your interferon and that's when you get a recrudescence of a virus infection. So having antiviral drugs that make you feel bad is not a good solution to the problem. Okay, how do interferons limit virus replication? They directly inhibit, interferons directly inhibit viral translation. Interferons lyse viral particles. Interferon induce ISGs. Interferons damage cells, none of the above. Interferons induce ISGs, C is the answer. That's how they uh, inhibit. They, interferons themselves do not do anything directly to viruses or virus processes. It's always the interferon-induced gene. That's the key point I want you to get from this, that they make things that then, in turn, the ISGs, who, which then are the damaging things. They're antiviral and they're damaging as well. So interferons are part of the uh, cytokine response of the innate immune system. Again, sensing foreign nucleic acids and proteins to make cytokines. Some of those are interferons that establish an antiviral state. There are other components of the innate immune system. They include dendritic cells, macrophages, and natural killer cells. On the left is a dendritic cell, lovely cell with these long processes. That's why they were originally called dendritic cells. They look like dendrites in the nervous system. And on the right is an NK cell, two NKs checking out a red host cell. And what these uh, cells do, they patrol your body continuously. They're always floating around in body cavities and tissues and circulation. And they're looking for something foreign, for some trouble uh, going on. Let's talk a little bit about how that happens. There are a lot of different kinds of dendritic cells in your body. And if you take an immunology course, you'll learn a lot about them. Uh, there are t dendritic cells in the blood. There are dendritic cells that patrol tissues. And some of, they're all shown here. The dendritic cells have the dendrite-like appearance to them. So here in the intestine, uh, we're looking at the intestinal lumen at the top with the, uh, the brush border, the villi, if you will, on the top. And viruses are infecting those cells, the red particles. And here we have dendritic cells just in the subepithelial space. They're patrolling there looking for things coming in, they're looking for infections of these monolayers, so the cells releasing cytokines, which would activate the dendritic cells. They're looking for viral antigens. You can see this one dendritic cell has even inserted a process through the tight junction and is sampling the lumen of the intestine. And they do this to see if there are any foreign antigens there. Uh, on the right are some epithelia, Again, epithelial sheets, skin, eye, vagina, and other places, they're also patrolled uh, by dendritic cells, looking for infected cells, for virus particles as well. Now, if a dendritic cell senses something foreign, if it senses a virus particle or an infected cell, uh, a, a piece of virus protein or nucleic acid, it will then go to the local lymph node to have that checked out. And that's what's happening here. These uh, dendritic cells are sensing viral antigens or nucleic acid, something foreign. And then they're going to the local lymph node, which is shown here. And of course, the lymph node has both B and T cell zones. And so these uh, dendritic cells in particular, let's say they've picked up a piece of uh, peptide and they're not sure if it's viral or host. They go to the lymph node and ask a T cell, is this foreign or not? And they do so by presenting the antigen to the T cell. We'll talk about that uh, a little bit more detail next time. But here's a lovely picture on the right uh, taken. This is a picture in a mouse lymph node. And you can see blood vessels in red. And the dendritic cell is in green. You can see it looks like a dendritic cell. And it's right next to a T cell, which is in blue. And this dendritic cell has got some peptides presenting to the T cell. And the T cell will tell it if it's foreign or not. And if it's foreign, a number of events ensue, which lead eventually to the adaptive response. So that is the role of dendritic cells. They can also make lots of interferon and release that locally at an infected mucosa, if you will, um, and try and clear virus infection. In fact, there are certain kinds of uh, DCs that produce a lot of interferon. 
but a, a main uh, activity is to go to the local lymph node and ask, is this thing that I found foreign or not? That's why we call them sentinel cells. So that's shown, the bigger picture is shown here again. We have our a virus infecting an epithelium. It's replicating. It's starting to spread. Uh, virus particles are, are being produced. These cells are dying. They're producing cytokines, including interferon. The dendritic cell can be, act we call it activated. Um, what that means, in a mo we'll see in a moment, by the cytokines released from the infected cell. So these cytokines are not produced unless there's an infection going on. They can also be activated by viral proteins and nucleic acids released from infected cell in the form of apoptotic bodies or just uh, proteins or nucleic acids on their own. When the dendritic cell, again, senses that there are foreign materials present or when they're activated by cytokines, the dendritic cells undergo a maturation. They're activated. They, they look like a real dendritic cell now. They go to the local lymph node and then ask the T cell for some help in deciphering the nature of the antigen. And then, of course, if it turns out that there is an infection ongoing, that will lead to the adaptive response, uh, as we'll talk about next time. So there's this lovely continuum between the innate and the adaptive response uh, mediated by dendritic cells and other sentinels uh, picking up antigens and presenting them to the lymph nodes. So here is a close-up look of a dendritic cell. We have a, a normal unactivated dendritic cell on the left. These have a great tool chest of all kinds of things that they need to sense infection. They have toll-like receptors so they can find foreign proteins and nucleic acids. Uh, they have cytokine receptors so they can respond to cytokines being produced from infected cells. Um, they can make interferons and they have within them endosomes that have major histocompatibility class II molecules. We'll talk more about these next time, but these are very important for presenting antigens to other cells and asking, are these foreign uh, antigens? So these cells, these dendritic cells, can take up viruses and virus proteins and digest the proteins and place them in the MHC class II. Those are those little orange uh, blocks that we see here. They can also respond to cytokines produced by infected cells. They can also pick up pieces of dead and dying cells. And as, when they do this, they mature. Uh, a number of things happen. Uh, NF-kappa B is activated. A lot of genes are transcribed in the dendritic cell. They undergo morphological change. They migrate to the lymph node. And now the MHC class II molecules are on the plasma membrane. They have the peptides that they've collected in them, and they're going to present these to a T cell in the lymph node, which is diagrammed here. So the T cell receptor will engage the peptide in the context of the MHC2 molecule. A number of other receptor ligand interactions are involved as well. If this is a foreign peptide, the T cell will recognize it as foreign. It will become activated. Uh, and in this case, it will differentiate uh, into a helper T cell. The, the dendritic cell at the same time is making cytokines that will eventually help uh, the T cell to mature should this be uh, a foreign peptide. Of course, if it's not foreign, then that's the end of the story. Uh, and then there's no further activation of the T cells. There's no adaptive response. But this is the link I was telling you about between the innate and the adaptive response is when the innate response feels it can't handle the level of viral replication that's being sensed, then it goes to the lymph node uh, to activate T and eventually B cells as well. We will talk more about that next time in, in some more detail. Uh, the other sentinel uh, is the NK cell, uh, which uh, will also patrol tissues looking for virus-infected cells. They do so in an interesting way. So here on the left is an NK, NK cell. And here is a target cell, which is under scrutiny, as you can see here. The NK cells have receptors on their surfaces to an MHC molecule. And this uh, interaction is considered normal. It's called an inhibitory interaction. And this is balanced with another uh, receptor ligand interaction, which is called an activating receptor. Now, how does this work? Say this is a virus infected cell. Many virus infections downregulate MHC expression on the cell surface as a way of evading immune detection. We're going to talk about that next time. If the NK cell detects an activating receptor, yet low levels of MHC, it will kill the, the target cell. 
It's not really picking up a viral antigen on the surface, as we'll see happens next time uh, for MHC and T cells, but it's seeing a down regulation of the MHC molecule caused by virus infection. It says this must be a virus infected cell, so it releases mediators uh, that kill the cell. And that's how the NK cells, one way that the NK cells patrol uh, our bodies. And yes, there are viral modulators of NK cell activities. Uh, there are, for example, here's one cool one. Viruses downregulate MHC so that the infected cell can't present a viral peptide to a T cell. That's how it would be killed. But they make a molecule that looks like MHC, and the NK cell, cell says, oh, there's MHC on this cell. Uh, I'm not going to kill it, and goes off, and the virus is in there multiplying. A lot of cool, lot of cool uh, strategies like that. That's just one of them. The other part of the innate system is complement. A complement is a collection of many serum proteins whose activity helps uh, other parts of the immune response. And these proteins are always present. That's why they're considered part of the innate system. Uh, often they work with antibody that's, been, that's present in your, uh, your circulation. And the complement system has both antiviral and antibacterial properties. It can be activated in a number of ways. And I just want to tell you one here, this so-called classical pathway. Here we have a microbe uh, which can be recognized by a complex called C1Q. It's a number of proteins which can recognize molecular patterns on the surface of viruses or bacteria, very much like the toll-like receptors. And if they recognize something foreign, a series of reactions occur. There are a whole bunch of serum proteins with these names like C2 and C4. There are enzymes that cleave them. But really, the end result is if a foreign microbe is recognized, you can have uh, what we call inflammation production of cytokines and recruitment of immune cells into the area. We'll talk about that in a moment. You can have the assembly of what we call a membrane attack complex. So if you have an envelope virus, these complement proteins will stick into the membrane and break the virus open. Uh, or you can have opsonization. Uh, this is where antibodies uh, which coat a virus particle, facilitate their uptake into macrophages uh, to destroy the particle. And again, all this can be triggered by the classical pathway recognizing foreign antigens, but also by uh, other, par uh, other parts of microbes as well. The point here is that this is another addition to the early ways of, of limiting virus infection. It's part of the innate pathway because it's not induced. It's always present and can recognize uh, viruses as foreign. When you get infected, you develop inflammation. That is the production of cytokines, uh, starting with innate detection of foreign antigens and nucleic acids. You produce cytokines. These lead to what we call inflammation. And infected cells produce cytokines and chemokines, and they have an effect which we call inflammation. Inflammation is redness, pain, heat, and swelling. Those are the four classic signs of inflammation, uh, which were recognized many, many years ago by this encyclopedist Celsus in the first century AD. He called them uh, rubor, dolor, calor, and tumor. The Latin words for those four swellings, those four signs, redness, pain, heat, and swelling. And we know now what causes them increased blood flow, increased capillary permeability, and the influx of phagoc phagocytic cells like macrophages, dendritic cells, and NK cells, and the tissue damage caused by all of this activity. So if you get an infection, this is happening within you. But it, inflammation is a consequence of many things that happen to us, not just infection. So if you exercise a lot, you pull muscles, you break bones, you pull joints or whatever, you can get inflammation, the same four signs responding. The reason that we get this is because damage causes the same release of cytokines as does infection. So I went online to look, at a, to look for a picture of all the different syndromes associated with inflammation. I found this, cancer, cardiovascular, probably if you have a heart attack, you're going to get inflammation in your heart tissues, Alzheimer's, pulmonary diseases, arthritis, autoimmune. They don't have infection in here. Can you imagine? They left out infection, one of the main causes of inflammation, because I guess people don't think about as causing it. So remember, when we talk about inflammation, which we'll get into in a moment, it's not just infection. Lots of other things you do to your body cause the same signs uh, and as, a, as an infection does. 
So uh, infections induce the production of cytokines by the pathways we've talked about. And there are three classes, pro-inflammatory, which promote the activation of white blood cells. They bring white blood cells into the infected area to try and resolve infection. It's part of the reason why you get swelling and pain. And here are some of these. Then we make anti-inflammatory cytokines because you have to reverse the effect of the pro-inflammatory ones. You have to control the inflammation. These are suppressors of uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines. And then we make chemokines as well, which recruit immune cells into the area, uh, a variety of immune cells to try and uh, clear the infection. So when you get, and these, these chemicals all function, initially function locally. They're at a re respiratory epithelium, a gut epithelium, wherever the virus infection is occurring in the skin. But eventually they get into the circulation. These are soluble proteins, and so they have global effects. Flu-like syndrome, sleepiness, lethargy, muscle pain, no appetite, nausea, et cetera. So you get an infection here on the left is just that illustrated. You're making pro-inflammatory cytokines. Uh, some of these go into the bone marrow to start hematopoiesis. Make more lymphocytes, macrophages. We need them for this infection. But some of them go in your brain and make you tired and sleepy and so forth. It's a side effect. Some of them, some of them go in your liver and you can make other proteins involved in antiviral defense. But the key here is that a localized infection produces global effects. So something in your skin is going to make these global symptoms because these are soluble proteins. Now these chemokines and other cytokines act very much like interferon. They bind receptors on the cell surface. So here is an example on the left of a cytokine binding a receptor. We have specific receptors for every cytokine. That in initiates a signaling pathway involving phosphorylation, which ends up pushing uh, transcription factors into the nucleus. And then you have genes transcribed that are related to the biological response of the particular cytokine. So what kinds of responses are we talking about? Well, one of them is very cool, and that involves uh, white blood cells getting into infected tissues from the circulation. Here's, here's the endothelial uh, blood vessel layer. This is, the middle, this is the lumen of the blood vessel at the top. And down here, say there's some virus infection going on. The cells are releasing cytokines. And one of their functions is to go in the circulation and say, say to cells, come here and help deal with this. And what happens is some of these cells they start to roll on the endothelium as they sense the cytokines. They're binding receptors, causing them to roll. They adhere, and then eventually they squeeze through the, the tight junctions between endothelial cells and end up in the tissue where the infection uh, is occurring. Here, this is a neutrophil, which has uh, anti-infective properties of various sorts. And you can see uh, here we have a receptor for a chemokine. It's produced uh, by the infected tissues. Uh, it, it ends up inducing integrins that allow the neutrophil to bind to receptors on the endothelium. That causes the neutrophil to roll and at rest and eventually go through. So these are some of the effects that chemokines can have. Again, in this case, cells are going into the infected area. It's going to swell. It's going to get painful. Uh, viruses, of course, in encode countermeasures of cytokines. They can interfere with the production of cytokines, their synthesis or their modification. Uh, some viruses actually encode homologs of cytokines or cytokine receptors. So they make soluble cytokines that block receptors on host cells, so there's no cytokine transduction. Or they make soluble receptors that will bind up soluble cytokines and prevent them from acting. It's really, really amazing. And, and some viruses can alter the signaling of the cytokines, which we just uh, talked about in the previous slide. So the bottom line here is that inflammation usually stimulates a potent immune response. The cytopathic viruses damage cells. They cause cells to break and release virus particles and viral proteins and nucleic acid. Uh, that, enact, that activates the innate response that's sensed. The cells produce cytokines, which cause inflammation. And that is why uh, cytopathic viruses have to encode proteins to modulate inflammation. Otherwise, they would be cleared. Viruses like adenoviruses, herpes viruses, pox viruses, their genomes are full of proteins that antagonize some aspect of inflammation, the inflammatory process, so that they are not cleared. However, there are a number of viruses that do not stimulate this inflammatory process. These are typically viruses. We call them non-cytopathic. They don't kill cells. So there are no dead and dying protein based particles released from the cell. The innate response can't detect the infection. 
and we have a very poor adaptive response uh, as well. So these non-cytopathic viruses, they don't cause inflammation, they don't have a good innate or adaptive response, and th so they typically cause long-term persistent infections. Herpes viruses, measles viruses, some polyoma viruses cause infections that last your lifetime because we cannot clear them because they don't make a good inflammatory response. So persistent infections rarely or inefficiently clear. The lesson is this classic inflammatory response, rubor, dolor, calor, tumor, that is the communication of the innate and adaptive responses. The innate responses are making chemokines and cytokines that are recruiting immune cells to amplify the reaction uh, to the infection. And you're gonna get a good adaptive response as a consequence. But if there's no inflammation, you get a very, very poor adaptive response. That means very poor antibodies, very poor T cell killing. And this is one reason we use what we call adjuvants in some vaccines that do not replicate. Some non-infectious vaccines, they don't replicate. They can't kill cells. They don't stimulate a good innate response. And therefore, we don't have a good adaptive response against them. So we add chemicals to these vaccines called adjuvants. We'll talk more about these later. And some of these adjuvants are basically TLR ligands. You, you inject them with the vaccine, they bind TLRs, that causes the synthesis of cytokines. You get a good inflammatory response and a good immune response against the vaccine. Remember, not all inflammation is caused by infection. You can have tissue damage. If you scratch yourself, if you scratch your skin, if you get a splinter, you have an incredible production of cytokines and chemokines. If you wonder why your scratch is swollen and red, that's because chemokines are produced and cells are coming into the area to try and fix the problem. And this is actually why the smallpox vaccine works so well, or used to work when we gave it to so many people, just the military now. The way the smallpox vaccine is given in, in this, what's called a bifurcated needle. There's a drop of vaccine in there, and you get it and you scrape it into the outer layer of skin. You, you cut someone, that causes an inflammatory response. And that's why the immune response to the smallpox uh, vaccine is so good, because you're inducing inflammation by scarifying the skin. So it's amazing, and this was only found out in the last five years or so. This was empirically determined to be a good way to deliver the vaccine, but it works because the scraping, the scarification causes a great inflammatory response and a great immune response to the vaccine. So what we've talked about today is how the innate response detects uh, infections. And next time we're gonna see how dendritic cells communicate in the lymph node with B and T cells to get uh, adaptive immunity going in the terms of antibodies and CTLs. But don't forget, at every step, and even if I don't mention it, there's a countermeasure. Everything I've talked about today, all viruses have to encode at least one regulator of intrinsic and aid, and as you will see, adaptive defenses. That includes all of these things that we've talked about today. Otherwise, they would not be here.